Hello. Hello, everyone. Uh, yeah, I'm Matt. Uh, so today, we're talking a lot about ZK. Uh, I'll let the, these people introduce themselves. But to kind of set the stage here, uh, a lot of people talk about ZK in terms of roll-ups. But uh, there's, it's, it is actually a fundamentally a, a, a core technology that is extensible to a lot of different uh, possibilities. And uh, on Solana, we have two projects uh, that are being represented today that have taken kind of a, a much uh, a different approach than, than that use case. And uh, yeah, how about you just introduce yourselves and your projects and like how and what, what is the positioning of how you use DK? Yeah, for sure. So my name is Nico, and I'm one of the co-founders of Elusive. And the idea behind Elusive is basically that we allow you to create uh, private accounts in which you can hold assets and use those assets to access existing smart contracts without anyone being able to track you on chain. So that's the core idea behind that. Cool. Um, hi, everybody. Uh, great to be here. Uh, my name is Sven. I'm a co-founder at a company building Light Protocol. Uh, Light Protocol uh, enables developers to build private Solana programs. We, uh, we fittingly call them PSPs. And um, private Solana programs are basically like regular Solana programs, but instead of having just public state and public state transitions, uh, you also have private state and private state transitions. OK, great. Uh, let's look at like, kind of the exciting, some far distant future. What is kind of the penultimate uh, case of these? Like, wh what do you see as the things that we're like, really heading for and really, really enabling? Yeah, so I, mean, I guess maybe it's a bit of a hot take. But I think in the more immediate term, at least, uh, privacy in Web3 isn't all that different from privacy in Web2. Because the thing is, in Web2, uh, for most mainstream users, privacy really is just you have a centralized entity. They encrypt everyone's data. Done. Privacy. And this doesn't sound very spectacular, but it's something that the average user essentially expects, but that Web3 doesn't have yet. Um, and, we th and I think this is something that's incredibly important to get to Web3 in the first place. Because when I meet people who aren't in crypto and I tell them, hey, I run a crypto privacy protocol, uh, generally, I first have to explain that blockchains are public by default in the first place. And the reaction there is never people saying, oh, I wish this is how Web2 worked as well, that everyone can see everyone's data without needing to ask for permission. And it's pretty easy to emphasize with that, because no normal person would want their bank account or bank account visible to the entire world. Mm. No institution would want their financial flows to be you know, visible by their competitors. So for that reason, I think in the more immediate term, what's really important is that we use the ZK programs and you know, ZK privacy to empower the use cases that aren't possible on Web3, whether that be DeFi primitives, whether that be more accessible payments, whether that be DPIN or you know, the 100 other great projects we see here at Breakpoint. Um, I just think it's incredibly important to have ZK privacy to actually allow to give the privacy guarantees that the average user expects when using these types of products. Yeah, can you, I, I'm going to double click on that a little bit. You know, do that. OK. Uh, what, what is it actually doing under the hood? So you, you, does the user have a choice, basically, when they choose, uh, yeah, when to use a private transaction versus a not? Like, when, are the, when, when is the transfer private or not? Yeah, so in the case of Elusive, at least, um, the way it works is that the most basic primitive that we have on Solana for proving that, you, you know, that you're able to execute a transaction is the signature, right? Because if you execute a transaction, generally what you do is you modify some state that belongs to you, or you're moving some assets back and forth. And so you need to have a signature so you can say, hey, I'm proving that I'm actually the person that's allowed to modify the state or move these assets. Uh, the small problem with signatures is, is that beside proving that you're allowed to do whatever action you want to take, they have the side effect of also leaking your identity, which isn't ideal. And I think this is where ZK comes in and solves a big problem. Because ZK is really nice in the, f in the sense that it allows you to prove that a statement is true without revealing anything other than the fact that that statement is true. So in the case of you know, the example I gave, executing a transaction, you can prove that you're allowed to execute a transaction without needing to prove, you know, without leaking your identity in the process or anything like that. And so with Elusive, we built a primitive whereby you then have the option that either you can you know, prove that you want to spend or an asset or call a smart contract using a signature, or using Elusive, do that same thing using a zero-knowledge proof, which then doesn't leak your identity. That's great. Uh, let's talk about uh, Light. So you can do even like, like flexible execution, private functionality. Can you talk about like, one of the things or some of the things that that might enable today? Today? 
Yes. Yeah. So right now. use cases today, um, it, it's it's really interesting. So, and, and I'll preface this by saying that uh, Light Protocol and and private Solana programs, you can build that on Solana DevNets today. So by today, you know. Uh, DevNet, and then um, you know it's contingent. Uh, mainnet launch is basically contingent on um, specifically three syscalls that we added to the Solana runtime, and they'll uh, go live in 117, which is set for early next year. Um, so having said that, uh, you know use cases there. Um, it's really, I mean, internally we joke that now you can build basically anything. Um, so the, I guess the question is rather what makes sense to build nowadays with that stuff. Um, and, and we do have uh, a couple interesting things that I'm, I'm personally really excited about. And, and we do have reference implementations for that for all of you developers. Um, uh, you can check that out. It's uh, basically, you know, uh, DeFi is coming in hot. So for DeFi, you talk about, you know, private trade execution. Right, so you have private, aka encrypted, matching of bits and, and, and asks, um, and settlement, if you like. Right, you can have any variation of that. Um, so I think that's a really exciting use case that you can build with with Light, at least. Um, and uh, then there's uh, another big one that I'm personally really excited about. It's gaming. Um, so if you want to have pure on-chain gaming and you have some PvP uh, situation where you have uh, fog of war or private, you know, hidden state that you need to have on chain. Nowadays, or you know, without something like Light, um, you would go and run your own Web2 server uh, to sort of enable this sort of obfuscation. Um, and uh, with something like private Solana programs, you can actually do that all on chain. So that's the two that I'm that I'm personally really excited about. Have you ever played One Night Werewolf? Sorry. One Night Werewolf or Mafia or like... Yeah, exactly. So Mafia, Werewolf, um, even if you have something like... I, I, maybe most of you guys have played Pokemon before or, or Yu-Gi-Oh! or these sort of collectible cards, card games, right? Like if you have trap cards um, that you don't want the other person to see um, for a given period of time, um, you'd want to um, have that encrypted and, and you can now put that on chain as well. Yeah, I play a lot of poker too, and there's been a talk about like how you do a random shuffle in a private yeah. transaction. Basically, like you have a bunch of people just submit a seed, uh, and you just have to know that your your seed is honest, and then you can yeah, then you can basically pass around uh, the confirmation that there was a, an accurate random shuffle because like you can prove that there was that the, the cards have been shuffled accurately through that program, and then you can like yeah, just play a normal poker without having to trust the dealer, and like it's minimally extractive because it's just done on an efficient blockchain, you know, Solana. Um, let's talk about um, like the uh, some other types of like you were talking a little bit earlier about uh, things that exist in Web two where you can have some private like maybe a, a, a company will obfuscate some things for you. Can you think about a little more examples of how uh, the Web three could maybe even enable some translations between what we see today in Web two and how it maybe look a little different? Uh, could you elaborate on that question? <laughs> yeah, so like, that's something I'm thinking about right now is like, uh, if I want to just uh, transfer, I can transfer to uh, like a, a bank or something, and like they would do the transfer for me, and no one else would see it but them, you know. And it's like private to the rest of the world, and maybe they can get audited or whatever. But like, it's private. Like, no, my employees don't necessarily have to see how much other employees are being paid or something like that. Can you, like, I, I'm just trying to think, like, under the hood, most of the, like, privacy today in, like, the Web2 world is kind of just done by, you know, hiding, like, a, some, some other anonymizing trusted agent doing things for you. So they're doing it, and everybody, maybe they can see that, and maybe banks can see it. But how does that differ from maybe, like, in the self-sovereign world, what privacy, like, what privacy means, I guess? Because it's just done in code. Uh, can you maybe describe the underpinnings of like that functional difference, I guess? Yeah, for sure. So I mean, I think the underpinning of the functional difference there, you 
already almost got to the point of it, which is really that instead of having to trust the company, basically, you know, the company telling you, hey, we're encrypting this data for you, and we're keeping this data safe for you. Uh, you don't have to worry about it. Instead, all you have to do is trust math. And you know, inherently, when we think about big companies, at least I think for people who aren't in Web3, privacy isn't something that people are that worried about. They sort of just trust that, for example, Google or something is storing your data correctly and is keeping it private. Um, however, in you know, Web3, we have been burned before, especially on Solana with things like FTX, right? Because the thing is, when you have private data, there's always two things that you have to pay attention to. Like, obviously, the most you know, intuitive one is you have to pay attention that it stays private in the first place. But the second part, which is why the, uh, ZK is also used for scalability a lot, is that it proves that you're executing something correctly and the state of something is correctly. And that's something that's very important as well. Because again, with the example of FTX, they might have kept everyone's data private, OK. But that had the side effect that you, know, you have to trust FTX that they're keeping this data private, but that they're keeping it correct as well. Um, and that's something where I think ZK can really help, because you can have privacy where you really don't have to trust anyone, except for some you know, cryptographic assumptions, of course. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's, you bring up a really good point where the trust in Web 2 almost comes like, oh, well, of course they're not going to mess with little old me. They have so many assets to worry about. But we've seen in Web 3 adjacent world, even the private companies have, like, that, that isn't enough of a, of, a, of a hold on them to not do something really bad. So it is much better to trust math. So maybe, maybe like, we'll just, I, I, this is a short talk, so we're not going to be able to get into it. But like, maybe what is that math? What that, that, and how, how do you think that you get a normal user to trust that math as opposed to Google? Yeah, I mean, so the math behind it is you know, zero knowledge cryptography, or ZK snorks to be precise. Um, in the case of us, we use Groth16 is the proving algorithm we use. Um, I think yeah, Sven can afterwards also explain how they do it. Um, but in our case, basically, the way you get them to trust it is really just on one hand, just using trusted algorithms that have been in the industry for a while that you know, aren't just something that we came up with ourselves, you know, the standard developer thing of not rolling your own crypto. And then beside that as well, I think explaining the exact uh, specific specifications of how these ZK algorithms work exactly might be a bit beyond the scope of this panel. Yeah. Um, but I think what's important in cryptography always is that most of the time, you don't really say, oh, this you know, cryptography algorithm works. Um, because we say for reason X, Y, Z, you always try to reduce it back to down to some base problem, right? Yeah. Because oftentimes you say, oh, this works as long as, for example, uh, hash functions are pre-image resistance, or as long as the, some you know, elliptic curve assumptions are correct, and so on. Um, and so in the case of you know, ZK, I think for the average user, basically telling them we use this algorithm, them having the ability to look that up, seeing that that's secure indeed. Um, yeah, should be sufficient for the more advanced user. Open sourcing your programs, programs is, of course, super important so that they can verify that it's not just us saying, oh, we use this algorithm to implement it correctly, but actually being able to you know, verify that. What do you think about that? Yeah, great. So all right, um, I think so, so there are two distinctive types of how you can r run compute, right? And, and one is um, sort of tr trustless. Um, or scale trust and verifiable, which is sort of what we have with Bitcoin and Ethereum and Solana, um, which is sort of really cool because everyone can verify the chain and everybody can, you know, veto if something's going wrong, right? That is the underlying principle of, of blockchains. Um, on the other hand, you have these trusted execution environments, right? Like if I have a Web2 server, uh, Facebook, um, or any company in Web2, like you, you inherently trust their servers um, to uh, to do the right thing um, and to you know store your data well. Um, and and so on the one side you have the verifi verifiability, which you know echoing um, Nico here um, with open source, which is really great, and and it comes at the expense of privacy, right? So um, taking the Web2 encryption and molding that onto the, the Web3 verifiability in open source. I think that's, that's really the, the powerful thing about ZK. Yeah, I really like the framing that making the, the question simple. Like a normal user is going to be able to understand, oh, uh, yeah, this is just verifying that I have this balance. Uh, it's above 10 USDC. 
And like, and like the, the questions can be really simple, and the fact that everybody else can agree on that, they don't necessarily need to know all the math behind it, but they just like see the social proof and they can see the simple question that is being answered. I think, I think that that's like a pretty, I really like that framing. Um, for the last like little bit here, let's talk about maybe the, the future a little bit. What, what is, like, how is the space going to evolve? Like maybe there's ASICs or other, other hardware improvements or there's fundamental um, uh, cryptographic improvements, like kind of like what, what are we, what should we look forward to um, in, like in the next, I don't know, two to, two to five years? Um, yeah, so in my opinion, in terms of, of course, ASICs and better hardware is going to come out. However, I think for the case of privacy, um, ASICs and better hardware isn't necessarily the go-to thing. Just because for the case of scalability, ASICs and better hardware is amazing. Just because in the case of scalability, the system you usually have is you have a blockchain, uh, a roll-up, basically. Um, that roll-up, you want to prove it inside of a zero-knowledge proof, and then you want to submit that zero-knowledge proof so other people can verify easily that the you know, rules of the blockchain are being enforced. So in that case, you can just have some super beefy server that has the best ASICs, the latest hardware, uh, generates that proof for you. The thing is, though, in the case of privacy, if you're saying, hey, here's my private data, giving it to a server, and you're telling the server, please generate this proof for me, that sort of defeats the purpose, right? Because at that point, you might as well just use you know, some centralized entity in Web2, because you are trusting a third party to generate those proofs for you. I so I think what's really important here is that, um, on one hand, of course, I could then say, oh, the thing that's important is to have more efficient ZK algorithms. But to be honest, at the moment, um, I think there's already been enormous progress in the space, and there is still tons of progress being made over the last couple of years with regards to ZK. So I think this isn't, I wouldn't say it's like a fully solved problem, but we're on a great path toward this already. Uh, so, oh, yeah. so you would, you would almost say that the barriers now are more like an integration barrier. So like basically get enough entities involved that are accepting those proofs as, I don't know, I'm, I'm, I'm certifying uh, where you live yeah, I, I live in America or something. Like, and, and I can just prove that without, without having to prove my entire address. Like, I, the, the 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 barrier today seems to be what is people just accepting that proof to verify that as opposed to some other identity. It's not a technical barrier. Is that basically what you're saying? Um, to some extent, but I think I think at the moment it's even more so of a UX problem because we're still in a case where, like, you sort of have. Existing programs like you know uh, Jupyter, Jido, like all these amazing Solana programs existing in sort of their own bunker, I w almost want to say, or not bunker, maybe not the right word, but like in their own world. And then you have the zk stuff living in a separate world. And there are bridges being built, you know, between the two to make them as connected as possible, which I think is you know what Sven and I are both working towards. Um, but there is some ways to go toward that still, so that the end user doesn't really have to think about, oh, I'm using a zk protocol. Instead, they're thinking, oh, I'm using my favorite protocol. And I'm doing so privately because why wouldn't I? Yeah, and then it locks this uh, thing. Okay, well, yeah. Cool. Yeah, I'll I'll just extend that with uh, two things. One is I think that um, in the future the majority of TPS on Solana will be encrypted uh, with zk. Um, could be uh, could be PSPs, could be any, could it be FHE, could be something else. Um, but I uh, and the second thing is it's it's mainly an adoption problem at this time, right? So we gotta really find the use cases for ZK that are not necessarily just anonymity for users, but um, much more what are the, the unique things that you can now build with ZK where users have this incentive to adopt the tech. Um, people have the incentive to build the, the programs that, that, that use ZK under the hood. And um, I think once we solve that, then uh, we, can, we can get to that path of en encrypting the majority of TPS on Solana. Great. So any builders out there, if your users care about being private or having some sort of anonymity and some of the functionality, look up these guys. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you.